precepts already promised, that's all I have with me. There is a study in there on visions of God. And that particular study has considerably more material on the presence of God than I'm giving you, so I'm calling that to your attention in case you are especially interested. <coughs> now then, are you all right? If some of you folk have trouble, there is there are some openings, some gaps over here. If you like to shift, if you don't see my face, you're going to lose some of it. <laughs> well, no, not because my face is worth looking at in a sense, but uh, often I speak with my face, it's part of my personality, and uh, if you don't see me, you just lose some truth, it's, it's the way these things work. It sounds strange, doesn't it, and preposterous, but still that's the... That's the, way it, that's the way it works. This way, uh, as I said, I can go with you about an extra half hour or something like that without getting bogged down. Now then, I have so appreciated being with you, and so does wife. She said, my, that's wonderful. That worship, that spirit, that openness of yours, that responsiveness is a treat. You see, I am in school. I come from school, you know. And what a difference. What a difference in receptivity. That it's a, a real delight to be with you and share with you the things of God. You know, we're getting so academic in our schools uh, and so neglecting of the things of the Spirit that the climate is so changed from what it was 25 years ago that it's hard to believe even by myself, who uh, has seen and, uh, uh, and sees it. The whole posture of people is changing more and more in the direction of the wisdom of this world. And I find that so hard to share so many things. In fact, I don't anymore. And so it's a real treat to be in a group where you can just there and where there is obviously such a receptiveness on your part. So we are having a treat. And I'll go back home on Monday for the treatment. <laughs> <laughs> there is more truth in that than you can All right, now, as Moses had prayed, show me now thy way that I may know thee. And the Lord answered him, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Just in passing for the moment, what you have there is the companionship of the presence of God. My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. The presence of God becomes a personal companion. I'll deal with that this more especially tomorrow morning. But for now, you know, one year I was going on my annual traveling around the world and uh, I had laid out my itinerary from uh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Manila, Singapore. And at that point, I just didn't know which way to go. 
I have invitations from everywhere, and I couldn't make up my mind whether I should go south to Australia and work my way back that way or go on westward by come home eventually by way of Europe. And I was there sitting before the Lord. Do you like to sit before the Lord? Ooh, that's delicious. <laughs> sitting before the Lord. I'd love to speak to you on it, but I don't suppose we'll get into it. And uh, I sat before the Lord. I said, Father, I just don't know where to go after Singapore. And I sat there just waiting, lingering, but not loitering. <laughs> And all of a sudden, here it came. And the words were, I will meet you at the pyramids. I knew what he meant. I used to stop in Cairo occasionally for a rest stop out there at the Mina House Hotel right near the big pyramid. There you're alone. And walk out in the desert. Some of you presumably have been there. And it's a place where nobody knows me, and that's where I get rejuvenated. <laughs> Not a soul around to ask me deep theological questions. Nobody to know you, just by myself. And so I knew what the Lord meant. You go westward. So I laid out the rest of the itinerary that way. And in due time, we were approaching Cairo on an Indian Airlines flight. I said, we, I was alone, usually go alone, sometimes uh, wife comes with me. And uh, we were beginning to let down near Cairo, oh, I'd say about 3.30 in the morning, and I saw Cairo's lights coming up beyond the desert there, saw them gradually coming up, and I thought, I wonder where he's going to meet me. Uh, near the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, there is a rest house, you get coffee. Coffee so strong that your spoon would almost stand upright. <laughs> and uh, get a sandwich, coke, sit there, look over the Sphinx, what have you. I like to sit there, just by myself, all for hours. It's my rest stop. And I thought, that's where he's going to meet me. I thought... While I sit there, he'll come along, keep me company, but he didn't. We were still a little ways away from Cairo Airport, and I watched the city coming up in the distance, just the lights, letting down over the desert, they were, and I thought, I just wonder where he'll meet me. And all of a sudden, there was a strong presence he had come to meet me before we ever arrived, and we rode into Cairo together. I went along with that lovely conscious awareness of his presence. No wonder God said to Moses, my <coughs> presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Now we're going to take some scriptures and look into this matter of the manifest presence of God, which is an experience of very great reality. First of all, a statement from John 4, 24, where Jesus said, God is a spirit. In Luke 24, 39, Jesus said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Now here you have to consider something. Uh, throughout all eternity, the Godhead, of course, was and is three persons. Now, up to the time 
of the incarnation of Christ, that is to say, when Jesus took on a human body, being born of Mary, up to that time, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost were uh, spirit beings. This is a bit misleading, but I'll qualify it. I just don't know how else to put it. Spirit personalities, neither one of the three possessing a material body. When Jesus came to be born of Mary, a change took place in the Trinity. The change being that the second person of the Trinity, and Jesus, he's regarded to be the second, Jesus, through the incarnation, took on a body. So from the time of the incarnation, one member of the triune Godhead has a body throughout all eternity. That was a change that came about through the incarnation. Now Jesus, of course, has a glorified body now such as we have, but he did not have that uh, prior to the incarnation. And so he says, uh, speaks about his hands and his feet, handle me, they could handle him, he had a body, they could touch him. And then he said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones such as ye see me have. So, if we'll put these two statements in juxtaposition, God is a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. Therefore, God is without a material body, even though he is a real person. You see, here is where we poor mortals have trouble. We uh, equate personality with corporeity. But actually, corporeity, the possession of a material body, has nothing to do with personality. We are persons independent, irrespective of our body. God is a person. He can see, feel, hear, speak, has a will, has emotion, <coughs> has all attributes of personality, yet he has no body. Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. When we die, we are no less a person after our death than we are before our death. Paul called this body a house, a tabernacle. He said, I'm going to get a new house. Now, we see our houses. The truth is, you don't see Walter H. Butler. You are looking at my house. This is my bungalow. I live in this bungalow. Someday I'm going to vacate it, but I'll still live. I say that because we need to differentiate between personality and corporeity. Again, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Paul said he's going to put off this tabernacle and be clothed with a new house from heaven. That will be our glorified body. 
Now, we are all houses. All I see is bungalows. <laughs> bungalows. I see some are uh, newer than others. Others are older. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and, and some could stand uh, a new roof. <laughs> <laughs> My roof is still pretty good. And I suppose if we pulled everybody, we might uh, find a, an artificial roof. <laughs> I won't try it. I'll get in trouble. <laughs> but think now of God as a, as a person, regardless of the fact that God does not have a material body. Now, do you remember this morning, of course you would, that uh, we use this passage in Numbers 12, and the form, the similitude, the shape, the likeness of the Lord shall he behold. Now, I take this position that God, even though he is a spirit, spirit personality, and does not have a human body, he nevertheless has a form. Now, this matter is a difference of opinion among theologians. But is it my fault if I'm right? <laughs> Thank you. I've been beginning to catch my humor. <laughs> the Lord has made this truth so real to me. Nothing could be realer. Realer, that's a beautiful So real. Now, you can do what you like with it, but I am showing you from the word that as far as I'm concerned, God has a form. Well, look here. Why would he say, and the similitude, the law, the, the, uh, the, the form, the shape, the likeness of the Lord shall he behold? If God has no form, no shape, no likeness, then what is there to behold? You see, I take these things the way they're written. I know some theologian will say, but this is an anthropomorphist. All right? There is anthropomorphic teaching in the Bible. But they use this anthropomorphism to, to tear away the supernatural and destroy much spiritual truth in the word that ought to be taken as it is. And here is where I have to go my own way. All right, now, I have some scriptures for you. Exodus 33, 21. You know this book, Exodus, is a terrific book. The revelation of God in, in, in this book is, is tremendous. Exodus 33, 21 and 23. Yes, now let's say. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face, shall not be seen. Uh, may I add something by way of parenthesis? In Exodus, I think it's either 24, no, 
it may be uh, 34, there is a statement where some men saw God. It says that they did see God. Jesus said, no man had seen God at any time. On the surface, this appears to be a contradiction, but it is not. Notice what we just read. I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And it's written in the word, but there shall no man see me and live. Seeing God refers to his face. But my face shall not be seen. When Jesus said, no man has seen God at any time, he is saying, no man has seen the face of God at any time. But Moses and others saw other parts of God at here you have it. Now, what you have here is simply this. Uh, may I be God for just one minute or so? Well, I'll be it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> would, you help, would you like to be Moses? Huh? Okay. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> All right, now, uh, we'll say this is a corner there, I can get into that corner. I'll put Moses in a corner, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, God said, I will cover thee with my hand. Why did God do that? So that the curiosity of Moses would not make him turn around and look at God. Because if you do, my dear Matthew, you'll die dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put my hand on you. I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by. And as he passes by, he takes off the hand. And Moses may look around. Thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Now, what God did there was to shield Moses from seeing his face because Moses would die. But God speaks of his hand. He speaks of his face. He speaks of his back. The impression you get, and you can't get any other one, I don't think, is that God appeared to Moses in human form. In fact, as far as I, Walter H. Butler, am concerned, God, as a spirit personality, has a form which is not material, it is spiritual, that God has a form like the human form, and when God said, let us make man after our own likeness in our image, God gave to man a physical form after the general spiritual form of God. In Genesis 5, 3, we have a statement there concerning Adam. Uh, 5, 3, Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begot a son in his own likeness after his now look here, we have the same terms that God is using of men. And therefore, it seems so logical to assume that God speaks the same way of man as at, at his 
spoken of, Adam and his son, that man looks like God. There is a certain resemblance there. I'm speaking now, of course, of form. And to me, Exodus 33 makes quite a, a point, and so does a statement in Matthew 18.10. Uh, where is Matthew? I'll find him. He'll be coming. Matthew 18.10 Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. If God doesn't have a face, what do they behold? Now I know they, they, they change that and they say, well, that simply means the angels are in his presence, but to me that isn't what it reads. And Revelation 5, and I don't know how people can get around this, in uh, Revelation, Revelation 5, 1 to 7. Follow this closely. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on, a, on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. I saw, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. Now take note that I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne somebody sitting. Now this is God that is obvious from the con uh, context as the Father. No man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. A out jump to five. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now this is Christ. And I beheld, I'll go down to seven. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now the father sat upon the throne. He held a book in his right hand. Jesus came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Again, you have here description, description of a form like the human form. And so I would conclude, and this is very real to me, that God as spirit nevertheless has a form. Now we know from elsewhere that spirits have forms. Uh, demons have forms. I've seen them as far as that is concerned. Uh, angelic beings have forms. And as far as I'm concerned, God has a form. And that someday when we get to heaven, we are going to be permitted to see the face of our Heavenly Father. If the angels always behold the face of the Father, how much more will the sons of God be able to see his face? You see, uh, we are sons. The angels are only angels. We are made a little lower than the angels. We are finite. I have to take a plane to go back to Allentown 
Angels don't have to do that, but when we get to heaven, we are going to have a greater rank. We are going to be sons. We have greater privileges. And you mean to tell me angels can see my father's face? And I, his son, am not allowed to see it? I won't believe it. Besides that, the pure in heart shall see God, and that satisfies me. So the others can go on with their theology if they like it. I prefer this because that is what satisfies me. Uh, the Lord had awakened me many times during the night at 2.30. I'm going to let you in on something. We have an extra service, and now I can uh, fit in some other things. <laughs> The Lord would awaken me on the dot at 2.30 at night, many times. And that meant sometimes to stay up, sitting in his presence, half hour, an hour, and sometimes through the rest of the night. And next night, 2.30, a presence in here, a worship, that would rise up on the inside, it often reminded me of the incense that was being burned in the tabernacle. The incense just rises so that uh, it woke me up. I look at my night watch, 2.30, and I know time to be up. Another time, the Lord sang for me, I told you that, and in different ways. Or, he would even knock. Uh, you can think of this what you like, but I know what I'm talking about. Have you ever read the scripture, Behold, I stand by the door and knock? Many a time has the Lord awakened me at night. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> Right next to my ear. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you scripture yet for something like that before we get on. I don't know about tonight, maybe so. I look at my watch, 2.30. Do you know that many times I can tell from, uh, I guess I ought to stay here. I can tell from the way he knocks what he wants. <laughs> That's right. I can tell whether there is something urgent. Shut up. And I know what it means. Get up quick. Or sometimes so gentle, barely audible. And, uh, oh, this is hard to explain. So delicate that I know he comes as a lover just for a little while of fellowship. Nothing special, but that is special, a little while of fellowship. It, it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable. And uh, some of you may have had similar experiences. He's done a time and again. And 2.30, I began to wonder now, what is there about 2.30? What's their special? Why 2.30? I knew there is no hour that's sacred, or more sacred than any other. But why 2.30? Oh, I'm losing my skin. Uh, <coughs> I, I guess I could say, pestered the Lord for months. Every once in a while, Lord, why 2.30? Uh, it just, you know, interested me. No, that's not the right word. I just wanted to know. And one day he gave it to me, one night. By the way, the night is not only for sleeps. The night is also for... Oh, the choicest things I've gotten at night. Ooh. Oh, yeah, I could speak to you along that line, but I wasn't in And the Lord gave this to me. 
by 2.30, you have had enough rest to stay up a while with me without falling asleep. <laughs> and when we get done, there is enough time left so you can go back to bed for more rest for your day's work. And I thought he was so considerate. Enough rest to stay up an hour and still enough time left to go back to sleep because he knows we need it for the day. And I thought that was so considerate and has been a great help to me. But I'll tell you something. This kind of thing requires discipline, self-discipline. The spiritual life is one of the most disciplined things that I can think of. For that, I can be up all hours of the night watching the late show, the late, late show, or whatever comes, I only speak from here, say, I have to get to bed. I don't socialize at night. I can't afford it. People hang around talking, doing this, doing that, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and say, oh, I couldn't be up with the Lord. Well, I couldn't either in that case. But when the time comes, 10 o'clock or so, 9.30 sometime, we're going in. We're the chickens. Oh, no, they ain't already. <laughs> <laughs> But then during the night, if he comes, yeah. you're in condition. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I was awakened. I'm, I'm measuring my words here. By the Lord walking past my bed, but I only saw him as he disappeared at the foot of the bed in white glistening garments. I said he walked past the bed. That was, a, uh, that was obvious. I just saw him disappear at the foot of the bed in white glistening garments. Full size. Not his face, just from behind. There he walked, right past the bed. And I heard the rustling of his garments. I'll get into this area of sound, manifestation through sound. Uh, I have a down here on the menu. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll move slowly. <laughs> I, heard, I heard that rustling sound and the closest I can come to by way of uh, description is to say it sounded like poplar leaves, the leaves of the poplar tree, that rustling sound when the wind blows them. That's what it sounded like. Mm. And my room was filled with the presence of God. I looked at my watch, night dial, 2.30. I knew it was time to be up. I got up and I had a chair there next to the stove where I'd be comfortable. The chair was waiting for just something like that. And sat there simply sitting in his presence till quarter to five. Quarter to five I had become quite uh, tired and weary. And I said, Lord, do you mind if I go back to bed? I waited for no answer. I just went back. Promptly fell asleep. And folks, us, folks, us. and I mean this literally. I was awakened a second time by two hands coming over my shoulders like this and pulling me into a sitting position in my bed. I stand by that. They literally pulled me up, and I sat in bed, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know whose hands they were. They weren't wise. She was in her room, I was in mine. 
just a tiny little room there in a cottage. Now we have a nice house, but then we had a camp cottage. I don't know if they were the Lord's or an angel's. I cannot say. Now you have scripture for that. For instance, the angels came and took Lot by the hand, right? And put Lot and his wife right out of the city. <laughs> they would have been destroyed with the city. Now, don't ask me how that can be. I do not know how it can be. I only know it be. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the incidents in the Bible. An angel came. I said, students, there is quite a presence here. Let's just pause with our study and see what that presence means. And at once we had a very powerful utterance in prophecy. And it just electrified that classroom and hands went up and oh, what a presence of God is. Worship and everything got quiet. Then the Spirit of God put on an operetta. Did you ever hear an operetta in the Spirit? A student, the girl started out singing, and she went, oh, she went, now, I'm no musician, but she went way up to K. <laughs> <laughs> way up to K. And stopped as though she was at the throat cut. Another girl, a fellow girl, and they began, to stay, uh, they sang, uh, answering each other in the spirit. Then we had the interpretation. And the interpretation had to do with the, the uh, love relationship between Christ and his church. And then the power fell again, and there was rejoicing. One girl over here got the baptism with the spirit. Well, the hour went by. The bell rang. We were supposed to leave the classroom, but nobody left. Everybody was just praising God. <laughs> Another class came down the hill to get into this classroom. They couldn't get in because we didn't get out. <laughs> so they stood outside in the vestibule, and while they stood there wondering what they should do, the spirit fell on them, and they went off. <laughs> Another hour went by and we were still here. <laughs> the bells rang again and uh, the third class was supposed to get in now during the third hour. They couldn't get in. They, uh, we were still there. The vestibule was filled with the others. So they stood outside wondering what they should do. While they wondered, the spirit fell on them on the outside of the room, outside of the building, and they went up. And by the time noon came, the spirit fell upon the entire school. And for dinner, there were only about six or seven students there out of several hundred, at least in the 200 somewhere. Now, when Bible school students don't show up for dinner, there is one of three reasons. Either they're sick, or either they're in love, or else there is revival. Right. <laughs> this was revival, and we had about a 10-day revival that was sweeping out all places, God moving in a mighty way for that length of time. It began during the night. I believe that without this, during the night, this revival would not have come. I believe it had its origin in this leading of the Lord and waiting on him during the hours of the night. Now, uh, this, uh, this uh, meeting the Lord at night, this spending time of his pre in his presence, is of tremendous value in this area. Now then again, Jeremiah 23 uh, 24. 
Uh, I told you that the Lord had been training me during the hours of the night, and this incidentally that I gave you was part of it. And then the Lord had so impressed me one night with this scripture. Do not I fill heaven and earth. And this became such an intense reality to me, and has been ever since that I have no trouble drawing nigh to God anywhere at all. It doesn't make any difference in what environment I fight myself. I know God is there. And you know, this is very practical. When you are on a transatlantic plane, <laughs> And you find they're out over the water and they start turning around for no apparent reason. And then after a while the crew goes to the emergency exit still way up. And they don't make an announcement. I have that against TWA ever since. <laughs> and then you look out and lo and behold a huge cloud coming out of one wing. I didn't know what it was. I thought we were on fire. And a huge cloud coming out on the other side. Now I know they were dumping gas. I didn't know it then. I thought it was fire, but they were dumping gas. And then comes the announcement. Uh, we're having a slight difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> we are returning. Help is already on the way, a little difficulty. Uh, we are now preparing you for an emergency landing on the water, just in case this should become necessary. Please take off your shoes. <laughs> take out your false teeth. <laughs> Loosen your collar. Take off your tie. Open your shirt. Yep. Remove all objects from your pockets, pencils, and the like. Put your seat in upright position, tighten your belt as firmly as you can, take a pillow. Hmm. Put a pillow over your face, cross your arms, and <laughs> lean on the seat in front of me and await this instruction. If need be, we shall gently land on the waves and gently pop up and down <laughs> like a seagull. <laughs> <laughs> Until help arrives. <laughs> Why, they may not sound like a picnic. <laughs> and some of you probably have been flying or are flyers, and you know this is a dangerous operation at the base. It's dumping up the gas and what have you. A slight difficulty. <laughs> That's when I said goodbye to my family. Each one, that's the fourth time, though. <laughs> yeah, that's when I sweat. Everybody sweats, nobody says anything. I said, Father, to the best of my knowledge, I'm in your will, and if this is it, so be it. But I said, you know, your book says, do not I fill heaven and earth. And I said, if you fill heaven and earth, you fill this cabin. And if you fill this cabin, then you and I are in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. I said goodbye to the family already, and I committed myself to the Lord. And I said, Lord, one thing I know is as we go down, you're going down soon. Now, I knew he wouldn't drown or something, but it was nice to know. And you know what? When I said, you and I in, are in the same boat, I felt a sense of his presence. He was there. Now, we, we were able to get on land. We didn't have to land on water, but at the time, it was an open question. They took no chances with that. But in those situations, it's nice to know he feels the heaven and earth. Or down over the Amazon jungles, 
are the plane that's having trouble trying to reach a landing field across the Amazon, sitting by the window, and you watch the trees come up. <laughs> Slowly they're moving up, and they're hurriedly serving sandwiches to keep passengers occupied, and nobody eats them. <laughs> they're all watching the trees. <laughs> Hey, the mother watching the trees coming up. <laughs> Some of them were high. Yeah. You wonder how so this one of them going to brush the undercarriage <laughs> and then of course, zoom. Nice to know, Father. You're here too. You fill this place. Or on another occasion, the same area. A lightning coming down everywhere, the cup and lit up right. He just didn't know what was going to hit me. It's nice to know, Father. You're in this cabin too, so we are together, aren't we? To me, this omnipresence is real. It's not merely a theological fact. Right. It's an intense reality. Or Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, uh, And thy father which seeth in secret, and thy father which is in secret, shall reward thee openly. That's such a help in prayer, this, this knowledge of the omnipresence of God. Uh, you, you pray, you feel nothing, you see nothing, you have nothing, everything is empty makes no difference. And you can say, Father, I thank you for your presence. Well, but I don't feel him. Well, thank him anyhow. What for? Well, he's there. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be telling a lie? No, that'd be telling the truth for once. We think he's absent when we can't feel him. He says, I'm everywhere. He fills his room. He feels your home. You can walk in tonight and say, Father, I thank you for your presence. Well, I can't feel it. That's got nothing to do with it. He is present not because you feel him to be present, but because it says that he is. The book says so, therefore, it's so. And that's the omnipresence. But then the manifestation of his presence, I like to call it, oh, I change it sometime, the personalized presence of God or the localized presence or the manifest presence of God. And that is where we're going to move into now. Uh, I must speak through my experiences. Uh, I have no time to explain to you the method, save perhaps to say, hmm, do you remember when Jesus said, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, ye have no life in you. And when this blood, but we don't say that now. Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man. Now, he was the embodiment of the truth of God. He was the word, truth, the life. The experiences which God in his mercy has given me is really personified truth. It is the embodiment of truth. And if you will eat the experiences that I give you, if you'll accept them, if you take them, there is truth in those experiences that becomes your meat and your life. It is truth personified. Except ye eat the flesh. And so God is using this means, in my case, to impart truth to people. They're not simply stories. They're the embodiment of the truth. They serve as illustrations but they also are demonstrations of the truth so that we know how the truth can be applied and does work out in personal experience where we live. The teaching I give you is not theory. 
it is truth applied to our daily experience where we live and can live for you. That's where we are operating. And so I'll give you something here to introduce this person to <coughs> I had a weekend in Altoona, PA. Monday morning, I was at the railroad station reading the New York Times. As I was reading, I got a little check in my spirit. I knew what it meant. You see, you learn the checks of the spirit. You, uh, you, you learn that. I knew what it meant. No words. Just a little presence inside, I knew what it meant. What did it mean? Don't read the newspaper. All right. I folded it up, held it in front of my face, and said, Father, what do you want? At once, I got a spirit of prayer and intercession, an intercessory type of a spirit. Ah, that was it. I had intercession all the way into Philadelphia. That night, as always then, I, was, I had a night school there in Philadelphia, uh, connection with our school in Green Lake. And uh, I thought, I'm going to go to a Chinese dinner. I had a Chinese appetite. And the Lord checked me. I was already halfway up in the Chinese restaurant. When he checked me on the way up, I knew what he meant. No eat. He could. So I went to the Y where I had a hotel room, a room the night school gave me. Spend my time. Walked into night school, sat behind the table on the platform, and I said, my, isn't God real tonight? And the power of God fell. <laughs> and we had a move of the Spirit from that night on for five consecutive Monday nights. Someone said at the end that night, Brother Butler, when you walked in tonight, we could feel the presence of God walking with you. But the reason was I spent all day without eating and giving myself to the Lord. Well, some preachers didn't like it, believe it or not. <laughs> and as I later discovered, the pastor of the church where we had the night school, because people said, hey, you want to come to night school? Hey, we had the move of the Spirit in night school. Hey, somebody got a baptism in night school. We had a wonderful presence in night school. And the pastor didn't like it. So he called up the district and complained about Butler. Butler is stirring up the people's emotions. They said he's got a lot of Italians there. He just mixed him up as a big time <laughs> and called the revival. <laughs> I don't whip of anybody. And two officials of the district came to see me in my office at the school. Brother Putner, we want to have a talk with you. And I could tell from their tone something was up. We hear we have complaints about you. Oh, and what's the complaint? You're not doing any teaching at night school. You're stirring up the people and having a good time. And uh, some ministers do not appreciate it. That is strange. Why, I said, God's pouring out his spirit. I thought, that's a wonderful thing. No. They're getting complaints, and that has to stop. I said, what? <laughs> we want you to stop it. But I said, brethren, what if the spirit continues? I said, I didn't start it. I merely cooperated with the spirit and put nothing in his way. Well, they said, we believe that he is finished working. I said, but how do you know? They weren't even there. Well, they said, we believe he's through, and we want you to tell the student the spirit is finished working, and you're going on with the classes. They wanted me to tell these people uh, 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 an outright lie, and that shook me, and they were my superiors. 
I said, I can't do this. I said, if the spirit works, I am not going to stop him. Who am I? Well, they were adamant and trying to live. <laughs> then I had a camp meeting in New York State, and the spirit just moved for a wonderful week. He said, Brother Butler, we want you to stop whatever it is that gets you associated with all these so-called movings of the spirit. He said, I am getting complaints. People say wherever there is something doing, future is in the middle of it. <laughs> well, I thought they'd be glad I'd given myself to fasting and prayer and obedience to the spirit. And he talked very strong. For a whole hour, he let me have it. He was a good man, but I don't know what stirred him up. Well, you know, that shook me. That night, I couldn't sleep. Did nothing but pause and turn. I was so discouraged. I was getting so despondent. Here, my, my superiors in the district are telling me to stop the thing and tell the students a lie. The president of the school criticizes me for uh, having this, this move of the spirit in a camp meeting. There was the night school. Well, there was three. Oh, yes, and in our school we had a revival. And Peter was in the middle of it. I think the greatest revival we ever had. It, it was in print for a while. And I got shook. I thought, I am going to quit. If this is Pentecost, they can have it. <laughs> if this what school is like, I am through. I am going to quit the whole thing. I was, I was despairing. I was being knocked over by the attitude. The next night, I fell asleep. And folks, it, we lived at the time in a camp cottage that had three wooden steps coming up. I was awakened out of a deep sleep by someone's footsteps walking up the three steps outside the cottage. I was awakened when somebody doesn't make enough sound, it's, it's a more of a forty sound. When somebody stepped on the footstep, I woke up. And I instinctively knew, but they would ask me how. It was the Lord. And I heard him walk up outside the three steps. I heard him take hold of the knob of the door on the outside. The knob usually rattled, it was a loose sort of a thing, and I heard that rattle. I heard him turn the knob as, the, as it squeaked through the turn. And I heard him pull the door open. As he did, the Venetian blinds on the inside rattled as they always did. I heard him step through the door, Take hold of the inside knob, pull the door shut behind him, the blinds rattled as usual. I heard him walk through the diner. This is not indicating his walk, the floor is in the right of the But I heard him walk every step. He came through the diner. He stopped 
outside the bedroom. He had no door there, just an opening with the temple. I heard him turn. As he walked in, I heard him turn around to face the door where we were. We had double beds. I was on the upper deck by the door. And then he spoke in an audible voice. A rich deep, <coughs> masculine voice, an audible sound, sound, word sounding like you would sound, not as strong as I speak, but he just spoke as an individual would to an individual, conversational voice. He had come, let me get this straight, he had come, oh yeah, to reassure me, he reassured me that he was with me and that he would defend me against all my enemies. I heard him speak in an audible voice. With that, I heard him turn back again. Facing the dialect and the door, I heard him walk out. Walked over to the door. I heard him take hold of the knob, pull the door open, the blinds rattled again. I heard him walk through and go down on the first step. I heard him take the knob on the outside and shut the door behind him and the blinds rattled and heard him go down the remaining step. A personal visit from a personal Christ in a time of deep distress when I think I would have turned my back on the whole thing. And I think that's why he did it. And by giving me that vision, he enabled me to go on. And I came out on the top. I didn't know who the preacher was that sent a complaint to the headquarters. But I can be like a bloodhound. I said to myself, I'm going to get him. I'm going to find yet who it is. And I'd open the conversation here and there about the revival and the move of the spirit and the night school. And every once in a while, somebody said something that seemed to point to one priest at the pastor of the church where the night school was. I had suspected somebody else, that. but somebody made a remark that pointed toward him. Somebody else that pointed toward him. They didn't say anything, but I, 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 I got the point. One day he came up to school. Now that man never had anything to do with me. He was one of these aloof, touch me not characters. And he was at school and saw me and said, Hello, Brother Buter, how are you? I thought, he's my man. He's too friendly. <laughs> that wasn't like him. He is covering up. He is trying to leave me off the track. Hello, Brother Buter, how are you? He never did that. He didn't give a hoot. I thought, he's my man. Too friendly to be real. I said, fine. I would like to have a talk with you. <laughs> oh, certainly. <laughs> Come up to my office, such and such a time. Yes, it's nice. Mine was nice. And uh, he sat there, and I put my chair up close to him, here in a good place. <laughs> I wanted to see the white of his eyes. Do you know, brother? I want to ask. Get still a little bit, making me wonder. 
Turn the Lord, come the Lord, pay my children so. And now in closing, we'll turn to the New Testament. That's a delicious verse. <laughs> At John 14, 21. My voice is giving out now, but I'll be all right yet. Um, and he said, <coughs> I may have to come back to this tomorrow, but for now, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, our love for the Lord is not evidenced by what we say, but by what we do. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. Well, I thought the Father loves everybody, but here this love is conditioned. As thou saying, the Father loves those that love me, that keep the commandments. Now, what you have here is a special love. It is talking about a token of, of his love. And I will love him, and the token of his love, the evidence, the reciprocation of his love, yeah. is in this word manifest. And I will manifest myself to him. Now, you can go to the Greek here if you like. And are uh, different translations, and this is what you get. I see now. For this word manifest, I will make myself real to him. Another, I will show myself to him. Another, I will plainly show myself to him. Another, I will make myself known to him. And I think you find in the pulpit commentary, which I think is based on Thayer's Greek lexicon, anyhow, this is top authority in, in New Testament Greek. It says that in the Greek, this word manifest is so strong that it can mean nothing less than a manifestation of the presence of God perceivable by our human faculties, such as sight, hearing, and what have you. So strong, he says, that it can mean nothing less than a manifestation of the Lord perceivable by our uh, human faculties. Now, on this we're going to build. Tomorrow morning we'll go into sight and hearing and touch as part of the manifestation of the Divine Presence. For tonight, I think we've had enough. I have. <laughs> and so I'll say good night to you. Nice to be with you again. Now, all these things I told you, these experiences, they are the absolute truth. Nothing added, nothing embellished, so it was. Well, what is it? And I will manifest myself to him. I will, oh, another, I will reveal myself to him. I will disclose myself to him. I will plainly show myself to him. Here it is. John 14, 21. Why should we not experience the personal presence of a personal Christ in our life? The presence of God. How shall we close? Show me now thy way, that I may know thee. And may the good Lord say to every one of our hearts tonight, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Amen.